Okay, you guys, here is the brief summary of the Unit 7 respiratory antihistamine and GI drugs that we I wanted to show you today in our super abbreviated summer session. So I'm going to do it now instead. And this is going to really kind of give you the need to know stuff for your test um, on this Unit 7 and the beginning of Unit 8. So I want to start with a little talk about asthma. So asthma is a um, very common condition that um, affects tons of people, both adults and children in the United States and everywhere else in the world as well. And asthma is considered an atopic disorder, it's, which means it's immune mediated. And it is essentially thought to be like a hyperreactivity or a hypersensitivity disorder. And it affects the airway primarily. And what it does at the airway is when um, an antigen is encountered, it causes the airway to constrict. So it causes bronchoconstriction, and you can see that on the picture on the bottom there, the asthma, an acute asthma attack, you see a contraction of the smooth muscle that lines the airway. And also you see, because this is an allergic condition, you see an increase in mucus production. So by constricting the airway and producing the mucus, you can't, we kind of form like a plug there. And that is what's characteristic of an asthma attack. Um, asthma falls into the category of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, along with emphysema um, and cystic fibrosis and chronic bronchitis. Um, chronic bronchitis, cystic, uh, pardon me, uh, emphysema and asthma being the most common of those. Um, but it's a little bit different from, say, emphysema and or chronic bronchitis because it comes and it goes, sort of waxes and wanes. And so patients are affected with asthma to varying degrees. For some people, they have an asthma attack every couple months, maybe once a couple every couple years. Other people are having asthma attacks, you know, almost daily, if not daily. So the management is going to be a little bit different. But we, what we have to think about when we think about managing asthma is we have to kind of consider it as an allergic disorder and so sort of think about it that way. So really the treatment is two-pronged, the approach is two-pronged. And those two prongs are one, you have to have a drug that opens the airway, and those are oftentimes referred to as rescue drugs, I'll show you on the slide in a minute. And the second is you have to have something to deal with the inflammation. One of the things we know with inflammatory disorders is that over time, like uh, with each insult to the airway, there's gonna be a process of what we refer to as airway, airway remodeling which is kind of just like the resolution of an inflammatory reaction. And um, what that essentially does is it causes uh, the airway to ultimately become scarred and narrowed over time. So over time, the airways are gonna become less distensible, less elastic, and a little bit more stiff. And those are then, that those people are gonna have, probably have more respiratory compromise later on in life. So we are trying to avoid that. So opening the airway is important in an, acute in, in an acute attack, but managing the inflammation is another very important part of this. So you can see on this picture we have, um, this is a sheep uh, airway, uh, the sheep lung, but this is a nice picture because what you see is the smooth muscle staining red, but what you see is the collagen, which would be the scar tissue, stains blue. And so this is an unchallenged, means it, meaning it hasn't been, um, it's, it's not experiencing, it's not hypersensitive. So there, this is an airway that's not reactive versus this one over here, which is a challenged airway. And you can see how different that looks, right? You can kind of almost see all the mucus, right? Here, these cells are hypertrophied. And then you see all that collagen, right? And so that's gonna be really, really stiff over time. The challenge here is dust mites. And again, the thing about asthma that makes it tricky is that the, Airways are often challenged by many other many antigen, not just one. You know, um, it sort of depends. Sometimes it's one thing, other times it's all kinds of stuff like environmental things, food, stress, exercise. There's all sorts of things that can set somebody off. All right, so when we think about drugs, <clears throat> there's a whole bunch of choices. So remember, we're going to kind of approach this from this two pronged attack. One of which is opening the airway. So the drugs that open the airway are referred to as simple bronchodilators. Oftentimes they are referred to also as rescue drugs because they open the airway in an acute attack. Um, of these, the drugs that are most common and are really considered our rescue drugs are, I'm trying to use my pen here, whoops, are um, these guys. 
the cephatomimetics, right? So this right here is our rescue drug. Sorry, I can't really draw a circle with my, my right hand is not circle worthy. Um, okay, so these are our rescue drugs here. Um, xanthines, you guys might remember these from our conversation today. These are central nervous system stimulants, but they do act as a bronchodilator. Again, they're not going to be as good as the sympatomimetics, but they are, um, they are effective. And um, then we have our anticholinergics. And these guys aren't as useful for asthma, but they are useful for um, emphysema. The reason why, I mean, they could be used for asthma if you didn't have anything else, because they do bronchodilate, but they also are pretty drying to the mucous membranes, which sounds, which you know, because they're anticholinergics, which sounds okay, but when you dry out the airway, um, there's some evidence that that makes it more reactive for somebody that's um, challenged, allergic, to, has allergies. So um, for that reason, we steer, kind of steer clear of them in your sort of standard asthma bronchodilator. So by far and away, the sympatomimetics, this is, these are... Um, most appropriately going to be beta-2 agonists, as you know. Um, the drug that's used most commonly as a beta-2 agonist is albuterol. It's given and used in those meter dose inhalers, and it works really good for most people for opening the airway. So they're going to have to have that some kind of bronchodilator with them all the time in case of an attack. But then we have some other options for bronchodilators with anti-inflammatory effects. So these are things that are going to decrease the likelihood of that airway remodeling. The oldest drug on the list there is chromalin, which is a prophylactic agent. All of these are going to use, be used prophylactically, meaning that they're used to stave off an attack, not when they're having an acute attack. When you need to open the airway acutely during an attack, you do not want to use one of these anti-inflammatory drugs. They just aren't really that good at opening the airway. I mean, they do to some degree, but not not in an emergency situation. So chromalin's the oldest drug around for this case. Um, I think its brand name was Intol, if I remember correctly, one of them. Um, like I said, it's been around, it's pretty effective. It's a mast cell stabilizer, meaning it keeps the mast cells from spitting out a bunch of histamine, which is part of the problem with this um, allergic situation. Newer than the pro, than chromalin are the leukotriene modulators or modifiers. This is where drugs like um, Singulair come in. You probably have heard those of that drug. Um, that's gone uh, over the counter now. Um, and you can see, so leukotrienes, what they do is, a leukotriene generally is something, it's like a cytokine that promotes swelling, inflammation, and bronchoconstriction. So what these do is they stabilize these. They, they block the um, synthesis of leukotrienes, or they uh, some of them might block the receptors. So they inhibit that um, message, which would promote the edema, the inflammation, and the bronchoconstriction. So those work pretty good. Again, they're a little bit better prophylactically, not so much in an acute situation. And then corticosteroids are used either inhaled or systemic. Um, in some cases, corticosteroids are used during an acute attack. They're very definitely anti-inflammatory. They're not, I mean, and they will open the airway to some degree. Um, they're probably going to be used more in an emergency situation if the simple bronchodilators have um, failed or they're not getting control of the attack. Um, if someone's having, having an asthma attack that doesn't go away, they can't get it under control, that's called status asthmaticus. I think that's in your book. And corticosteroids are also oftentimes useful in that situation. All right, so um, there's some newer drugs. This, these are biologics. You're not tested on these, but they're kind of interesting, and I think this is uh, probably a oh, direction that we're going to be going in, more and more of these. Um, so these monoclonal antibodies, they are going to attach to, the uh, to a receptor on the IgE antibody. IgE are known for allergic responses. And by attaching to the receptor on the IG antibody, IgE pardon me, antibody is it neutralizes the antibody. So that looks kind of promising. Um, but they're relatively new and they're pretty expensive. And so it's, to my knowledge, we aren't really using these too much yet, but I'm sure this will be something we see more of. <clears throat> okay, so that's asthma. Again, you're gonna remember two-pronged attack, uh, airway drug opening airway a drug that opens the airway part of me is going to be our rescue drug and then something to manage one manage the inflammation all right so let's switch and talk about coughing for a minute a drug that inhibits coughing is called an antitussive 
So really there's two big categories of these types of drugs. One would be a narcotic antitussive. And the way these narcotics work is they depress the cough center in the brain, so they're centrally acting drugs. Um, and opioids are the most effective of these narcotic antitussives. So on our in our class today, if you're watching this the same day we had lecture, we talked about codeine, um, and I showed you a picture of codeine being a pure opioid agonist, <clears throat> meaning that it binds both the mu and the kappa receptors. So this is where codeine fits in, um, in this con context as an antitussive. So obviously there's some risk with these narcotics, and we don't want to give them out to every person that has a cough. However, um, sometimes they're uh, the, what's the most um, necessary agent. Um, and the reason for that is sometimes people have a, a cough that's causing them maybe to not, you know, they're coughing so much that they're pulling muscles or they could actually um, uh, fracture a rib, in which case that we'd really need to stop that cough. And that's kind of where we think about these drugs coming into play, or they haven't slept for days because they're coughing all night long. Before you go to the anti the narcotic part of me, you'd probably want to try a narcotic non-narcotic antitussive, and you can see dextro dextromethorphan. That's in almost all the over-the-counter cough medicines like Robitussin, and Nyquil, etc. Um, there's a drug called benzomatate or Tesalon, which actually is a non-narcotic. Um, it doesn't act on the direct the, on the cough center like dextromethorphan but it um, anesthetizes the stretch receptors in the lungs. And when those stretch receptors are stretched, that, that stimulates a message to the, sends a message to the cough center, which then has somebody cough. So it's sort of an interesting, sort of a reflex kind of an action. Um, when we think about using an antitussive, I think this is more or less common sense, but a cough in and of itself, it doesn't really tell you anything. Um, it's just a symptom. And so the best, course of action would be to figure out why they're coughing prior to just giving an antitussive. Um, so there's a different types of cough in a general sense. One would be a productive and the other is a non-productive cough. A productive cough is when someone's coughing up a bunch of mucus and gunk, you know, in, inflammatory or, or cellular debris, etc. Um, pus, all that kind of good stuff. So um, when somebody has a very productive cough, right, the cough is the way for the body to get that stuff out of there. That's one of the, the reasons why we cough. Um, and so that would not be a great idea to like s inhibit that reflex because then all that stuff stays in the lungs and we don't want that to happen. So antitussives are more oftentimes indicated for non-productive cough, so more like an allergic cough, etc. Um, they should only be used for a short period of time, and again, that's because you need to figure out why they're coughing. There's a reason for that, and that would be what you would want to discuss to, or discover prior to just suppressing the cough. Again, you know, like if someone has to give a speech and they're coughing, or they're not haven't been sleeping and they're coughing, or they're pulling muscles and they're coughing, or they're coughing, excuse me, and they're pulling muscles or whatnot, that would be warranted. Again, it's short term until you kind of figure out why they're coughing. The reason why I'm kind of hammering this is because um, in cases of lung cancer, oftentimes the only sign of the cancer or symptom of the cancer for in ca some cases like months to years is this kind of non-productive, aggravating sort of cough. And so if somebody's coming in specifically for a cough, then that means it's significantly aggravating and you need to do a little bit of investigation or, or a lot in some cases. And I think the most um, responsible thing to do would be to make sure they don't have lung cancer, rule that out, especially if there's any risk at all for something like that which is not a terribly hard thing to rule out. And then once you rule that out, then you can kind of think about suppressing the cough if necessary. Okay, so those are the antitussives. So I want to talk to you now, switching gears again, I want to talk to you about histamine. Histamine is a inflammatory signaling molecule. It's a signal or molecule. It is a paracrine, which means it acts, it's released from one cell and acts on a cell right next to it. Um, it's tradition, histamine is released from mast cells or basophils, and again, it's a local irritant, so it's going to irritate whatever's around it, essentially. So we're going to, um, <laughs> excuse me, I don't know why I 
Uh, I'll come back to that other slide in a second. So um, so here's a mast cell degranulating histamine, right? They release other things as well, but histamine is a big thing. So anywhere you have a histamine receptor, the histamine is going to have an action. And one th the few things that we know about histamine is, one, histamine is a super good local vasodilator. And when the arterioles dilate, that's going to, one, bring more blood to the area, which will increase the hydrostatic pressures in that vessel. And the other thing is when the arterioles dilate and we move into and we push more blood into a capillary bed, capillary beds being only one cell thick, oftentimes um, when the capillary is kind of expanded due to the increase in blood flow, that can cause the, the spaces in between the cell, endothelial cells, to sort of gap, in which case water and in some cases plasma protein can, f can float out and then you get some swelling around that site. So edema and vasodilation are quite common. There's areas in the body where we have a lot of histamine receptors. One is the skin, so that's an area that's oftentimes uh, in going to be very affected by histamine. And when someone has histamine released and it's hitting re histamine receptors in and around the skin, they oftentimes get very itchy, they can develop a rash, they oftentimes develop hives. There's a lot of histamine receptors around the airway, so histamine can cause the airway to constrict, and that can be a player in asthma. And it can also cause shortness of breath. Um, I mentioned already the vasodilation, and so when you when we vasodilate, that can could if we if you had a lot of histamine rele being released, it could cause actually a decrease in systemic blood pressure, and would that have to be pretty widespread. But in which case, that would cause a sort of a reflex stimulation of the heart, like we know about when we talked about hypertension. So that could increase the heart rate. It could increase cardiac, or pardon me, then decrease cardiac output if the pressure is low. Another place where we have a lot of histamine, which is not on our picture here, histamine receptors, I should say, is in the gastrointestinal system. So there's oftentimes um, quite a lot of symptoms of histamines uh, in the GI tract. And it can sort of be the same sort of thing, vasodilation, edema, etc. All right. Um, so the drugs that antagonize histamine. So there's really two types of histamine receptors. One is called an H1 receptor and the other is called an H2 receptor. So the antihistamines are going to antagonize either the H1 or the H2 receptors. So we have H1 antagonists and we have H2 antagonists. H, when we think of an antihistamine like um, diphenhydramine or um, you know Benadryl, Zyrtec, Allegra, all those guys, um, these drugs are the so these are our kind of our traditional antihistamines when we think of like sneezing allergies etc and the reason why we think about them as being our traditional antihistamines is because we have histamine receptors all over the h1 receptors i should say all over the place so you can see notably the smooth muscle and the airway the intestine like i just said the arterioles and the capillaries so wherever you have a histamine 1 receptor, if histamine is released anywhere nearby and it binds those receptors, you would see that sort of characteristic response, which we know to be an allergic response. So these antihistamines, like diphenhydramine or um, Clarinex, but diphenhydramine is Benadryl, um, Zyrtec, etc., these drugs antagonize this H1 receptor. So the thing to remember is they're not keeping histamine from being released. The histamine is still being released, but it's just not able to bind the receptor because they're blockers, right? The receptor blockers, they're antagonizing that receptor, the active site. So that's how they work. Um, so they're not gonna be very useful if somebody's already having an allergic reaction. I mean, they might keep the allergic reaction from getting a whole lot worse, but they're not gonna prevent it from happening or reverse the symptoms that have already occurred, I should say. They can prevent it from happening if they take it early before they incur encounter the antigen. But what they're not gonna do is they're not gonna back somebody out of an allergic reaction. Um, there's other drugs like epinephrine is sort of the drug of choice for somebody who's having like a profound allergic reaction. We talked a, lot about, a little bit about this when we talked about shock. And the reason for that is because epinephrine will actually reverse the side effects of, or this, reverse the symptoms of the histamine, the, the H1 um, receptor stimulation by increasing the, um, by, pardon me, vasoconstricting, opening the airway, increasing venous return, et cetera. But the traditional antihistamines like Benadryl, their utility is really to block the receptors prior to the histamine actually being released. So that's a good way to think about it. If you don't have epinephrine and someone's having an allergic reaction, by all means, you know, Benadryl would be a, an, a, an obvious choice, but it's not going to be as effective.
There's one other type of histamine receptor that I want to talk about, and that's the H2 receptor. So H2 receptors are found in one place and one place only, and that's the stomach. So in physiology, you probably learned a little bit about histamine in the stomach. So it's released in the stomach, and what happens when histamine binds the H2 receptors in the stomach is it increases gastric acid secretion. So by antagonizing the H2 receptor in the stomach, you're going to inhibit the secretion of, of um, essentially hydrochloric acid, and then therefore um, increase, decrease, I should say, the gastric acid secretion. So it would alkalinize the stomach to some degree. So these, we kind of think of these as sort of antacids, but not in the general sense, like we talked about when we talked about the um, non-receptor, non-specific non drugs. These drugs are specific because they antagonize that specific receptor. So back to the H1 blockers for a minute. I've just mentioned they're going to antagonize allergic reactions like I just talked about. Another weird kind of effect in these, um, from our conversation we had in the central nervous system, we know that H, that his antihistamines actually can have a central nervous system effect as well. And so, and in the central nervous system, they act in most people as depressants. And there is a place in the brain, the vomiting center of the brain, that can be stimulated if someone's sensitive to motion. And that's what sets them off in this whole motion sickness cascade is the motion stimulates the vomiting center and then that causes the vomiting. And um, each one antagonist can actually inhibit that, so that emetic center, the vomiting center in the brain, which is kind of interesting. But they also act as CNS depressants, as we know. They have antipsychotic-like effects. That's the CNS depressant. So it causes most of the time sedating, although some people are wired funny and they get really stimulated with antihistamines. But the average person is going to be sedated. And they're also really antimuscarinic. And so they cause lots and lots of drying, dry eyes, dry mouth. Excuse me, I have the hiccups. Um, all right. The last one here, the H2 antagonist. So these are going to be specific to the stomach. That's what you want to remember. You've got some examples there. You don't need to remember them, but they're used kind of a lot. Um, so H2 antagonists, these ones are studied and approved for ulcer patients because they decrease gastric acid secretion. I'm going to talk more about ulcer in just one minute. They're also used kind of off-label to treat heartburn. I mean, they, they're used all the time to treat heartburn, but they weren't really studied for that. There's another kind of drug, which I'm not going to talk about um, too much at all, but they're called proton pump inhibitors. And these ones are, have really replaced the H2 blockers for, um, I don't really know for any good reason. I, proton pump inhibitors are kind of challenging drugs, and they seem to cause a lot of issues for many people. Um, but they def definitely do alkalinize the stomach quite a bit. I mean, the stomach's got a pH of like 2. And with proton pump inhibitors, we can see the pH go up to like an 8. As you can imagine, there are some issues with that which we don't have time to get into, but they're significant, so keep that in your brain somewhere. Um, <clears throat> so ulcers are confusing, kind of. So, uh, uh, an ulcer, so the stomach is a very interesting place, right? It's got a pH of, like I just said, like two, two or three, two probably more appropriately. And it's part of the tube, GI tube, right? It's part of the gastrointestinal tract, and it's lined with mucosa, just like everywhere else in the gastrointestinal tract. Um, but then you have this weird situation where you've got these like proton pumps pumping protons into the lumen of the stomach and it's, you know, basically, we're basically secreting hydrochloric acid in the lumen of the stomach, which seems like that wouldn't work all that great for the mucosa and that's true. And so a stomach acid, a stomach ulcer, pardon me, a gastric ulcer is is an insult to the mucosa due to the acid. The acid, the confusing part of it is the acid is not inappropriate, right? It's supposed to be there. What we don't oftentimes talk about is the mucosa layer of the stomach is the, the cells that kind of at the top of the gastric pits. I don't think I have a picture of the gastric pits, but at the top we have the cells that produce a huge amount of mucus. So these cells are spitting out all this mucus that's kind of sliming the inside of the stomach, right? The lumen of the stomach, making it really this thick mucus barrier, which keeps the acid in the middle and the mucus protecting the mucosa. So in order for someone to have a, to have a gastric ulcer, um, they, they has to have the mucosa has to interface with the acid, which it's not supposed to do. So there's a couple of theories around what, how and why this happens. Um, one thing we can agree on for sure is that there's some kind of breakdown of that mucus barrier because if there wasn't, their stomach acid would not, the gastric acid, pardon me, would not 
um, erode the mucosa. So somehow the mucus break, bear, there has to be a break in the continuity of the mucus, which allows for the gastric um, acid to back diffuse and kind of get trapped between the mucus and the mucosa. And then it starts eroding the mucosa like anything. What is pH of two, right? It's acid. Hydrochloric acid it eats, it will eat through cement. So it's definitely going to eat into the mucosa. So why that happens is the question. One of the ideas is that there's a microbe called Heliobacter pylori, which you see there, H. pylori. This uh, organism is pretty ubiquitous, but there is a correlation between the presence of Heliobacter pylori and gastric ulcers. Um, there's also a fairly decent amount, body of evidence that shows that a lot of people have Heliobacter pylori and don't have stomach ulcers, and some people have stomach ulcers and they don't have Heliobacter pylori, so it's obviously not the entire picture. But even if there, even if you have Heliobacter pylori, it still has to get some traction on that mucosa. And if the mucosal barrier was thick enough, it would be too slimy for that little microbe to get to. So that's another thing to think about. So treatment has to kind of be, you know, multi-dimensional in order to sort of deal with all of these things. So how ulcers are generally treated. First, they're tested for Heliobacter pylori which is not that easy of an organism to find. You can test it in the blood, you can for antibodies, you can test it in the stool. I feel like there might actually be a breath test if I remember correctly, I don't know for sure. There's something other than blood and stool. Um, and I don't, they're, they're all, they all have a, a, some limitation, but you could test for the microbe and if you found it you and they were symptomatic, meaning they have ulcers, you would treat for the microbe. And um, in order to do that, you should generally do some kind of a anti-secretory agent. So that's something that's gonna stop them from producing stomach acid, but it's short term, theoretically, because you don't want them to stop producing stomach acid forever. Obviously, there's a reason why the stomach is so acidic and sort of kind of outside of the context of our class. But if you alkalinize the stomach for any given time, you're gonna have some other issues, you know, um, and some of them can be quite profound. Um, so that should be relatively short term while you're in the healing process. Then we need to do something to keep the bacteria from sticking to the walls of the mucosa. And bismuth works great for that. You could do Pepto-Bismol, you can buy bismuth over the counter. Then you have to kill the microbe if you know that it's there. And that's easier to say than it is to do because there's a lot of resistance with these uh, for the, uh, this particular microbe has a lot of resistance. So traditionally we use at least two, if not three, different antibiotics. Um, amoxicillin, chlorothromycin is used, metronidazole is used, tetracycline. All of these is, have been used with um, success. Um, tetracycline is a broad spectrum antibiotic, so that probably wouldn't be the first choice. We'll talk more about that in our um, unit eight. There was an interesting study done in 2003 showing that aspirin makes the bacterium, the Heliobacter pylori, a little bit more susceptible to the antimicrobial agents. But then on the flip side of this is gast um, aspirin also causes some gastric irritation. So, you know, that's that may or may not be a good idea. Uh, so here's a summary of all of our drugs. So these are one of the ones that are used more frequently now, proton pump inhibitors. These are the H2 receptor blockers. Both of them are going to have the same net effect, which is to alkalinize the stomach. Then we've got antibiotics, two or three. Then we've got something, some kind of thing to alkalinize the stomach, maybe an antacid. Something to increase the mucus would be smart and decrease the adherence of and or decrease the adherence of the microbes. So there's sort of a lot to think about with, with gastric ulcers. The term peptic ulcer, I should have said this before, peptic ulcer is kind of a very generic term and it's to, um, it's basically just says we know that there's a ulcer somewhere, we just don't know exactly where it is. So anywhere that there's um, the potential for gastric acid to interface with mucosa, you could have an ulcer there. So you could have an, a lower esophageal ulcer that would be referred to as a peptic ulcer potentially. Gastric ulcer, duodenal ulcers, and once you know for sure where it is, then you'd be a little more specific in your terminology and name, you know, name it for where it's located. But peptic ulcer is just kind of this broad term. All right, so that is ulcers. Um, in terms of other GI drug classes, um, 
these are just terms I want you to know. You can see them in your book. I just want you to be able to recognize them um, and kind of have the basic knowledge of why or why not you would use these medications. The first are drugs for vomiting, emetics and anti-emetic. An emetic is something that's going to make somebody vomit. That would be like um, um, the syrup of Ipecac is what's coming to mind. An anti-emetic would be anything that inhibits the vomiting center. Um, you know, I just mentioned antihistamines do that, but there's other drugs to do that as well from um, all walks of life, from CNS depressants to a little bit more benign drugs. A cathartic, um, a cathartic and a laxative are similar in that they increase motility of the gut a lot. Cathartics are going to be more powerful than laxatives. They're big time GI irritants, usually in both cases, but they're going to get a lot of peristalsis going. So these are agents that are used in people that have decreased motility, but you have to be real cautious with these, um, especially with the cathartics. These are big movers and you have to be absolutely certain for somebody who, ha if you're going to use a cathartic, they're going to have to have a pretty severe case of constipation and you need to make sure that they're or that uh, I should say they might not have just constipation they could have some kind of an obstruction and that's what you want to make sure they don't have an obstruction because if you give a cathartic to somebody that has an obstructed bowel you could blow that bowel out which would be disastrous as you can imagine spilling bowel contents into the peritoneal cavity which is sterile so that was not something you want to do obviously so um, real cautious with cathartics and laxatives, but in general, you would give those to somebody who has slow motility if you're going to use them, making sure that you know they're not obstructed. An antidiarrheic, it's not the same as an antidiuretic, which we're going to talk about later. So these are drugs that are going to um, stop diarrhea, ideally. Again, diarrhea is like a cough in that there's a good reason in many cases why somebody has diarrhea and this is one of the ways our body gets rid of things that we don't want in there, in the gastrointestinal tract. So just be aware of that. You know, sometimes that's the right thing to do is to let that just happen. But you have to be cautious because there's risks like, you know, dehydration and electrolyte imbalances and those kinds of things. And then a carminative. These are drugs that aren't really used very much. It's kind of an old term. Um, it's a drug that dispels gas. So carminatives are good at that. They oftentimes are absorbed, uh, things that absorb things like um, activated charcoal, for example, could be an example of a carminative. All right, so just be familiar with those terms. Okay, I'm gonna stop this here and pick up the next one with a brief discussion on the eye and the skin. There's a much more comprehensive discussion of the eye recorded that you might wanna view instead, but this will be our kind of summary of that. So I'm going to stop this and I'll come back with eye and skin and the antimicrobials are on their own. All right, see you in a little bit.